in honor of this season also being the anniversary of the enlightenment of Buddha. I took this subject to a little reading by Tara Brock. Tara Brock is a respected Western Buddhist teacher. She has a mantra that says, this too belongs. So today we're just gonna spend a little bit of time, even amidst the celebrating, to notice that grief and loss too belong. And they're intertwined. Grief, love, and light are intertwined. We don't have just one. We all always have the others. And in the newsletter this month, I don't know if you noticed a little teeny reading down at the bottom. I placed something there. The author poses the question. She asks her friend who's had the loss of a, of a spouse, how are you really doing? So we all just went through the Thanksgiving holiday. And while it was wonderful to gather with family and friends, it's complicated. And what if we couldn't gather with family and friends? We have societal messages all around us of a warm and loving time with family and friends, and it is unrealistic for so many people. The responsive reading reminds us we can grieve those who we love but are estranged from us, we might be regretting some of our own actions of years past. Maybe we need to do something to resolve those. It's also possible to feel loneliness when you're in the circle of your family because you're just in a separate space than they are this year. I'm also aware in this fellowship, we have lost many loved ones this year. And, and there has also been declining health for many people as well. I experienced this feeling myself when I just went back to the Seattle area, and it was for my uncle's 100th birthday. And even though the party was incredible and people told such wonderful stories about him, I was realizing my uncle is 100, my aunt is 99, my mother is 95. And so there was that bittersweet of, oh my gosh, they are doing so incredibly well for their ages. None of them has a major illness. They are doing so well. And yet our time together is now so limited. The time made me sad because it was so precious. I was having what we call, believe it or not, anticipatory grief about the holidays and years to come when they won't be there with me. It's hard to watch a health decline in your loved ones but because the future, it comes closer to that pre precipice over here. And with your own health decline, there's grief and loss that comes with that in a society that says, be young, be strong, do it all, unrealistically. It's hard to watch others with chronic illness or chronic pain because we want to take it away from them and we can't. So I did a little research because I like to know what the social science says. And what the, what the social science says is, is everyone is experiencing this at one time or another. The American Psychological Association says 38% of the people they polled report increased stress in December. The National Alliance for Mental Illness found of the people they polled, 65% of people who already had some mental illness, anxiety, depression, report that their conditions worsen around the holidays. And then there are people who do pretty well for six to seven months out of the year, but when the light changes, they have seasonal affective disorder, which is an actual clinical depressive disorder. So how many kinds of holiday stress are there? I made a really short list and I'm gonna ask you to just fill in your own in your own quiet mental time because I'm sure I didn't get them all. Generalized stress and anxiety, because responsibility goes up. 
There can be physical and mental fatigue, financial stress. Consumer Reports says 31% of people that they surveyed cited getting into debt as a major issue, a major source of anxiety around the holidays. The high expectations of ourself and society. Travel stress. I hate being in an airport just about more than anything else. Disappointment if we're unable to see family and friends. And then when we do see family and friends, there can be drama or trauma if we are with certain family members or certain friends. And no matter how old you are, a trip back to a dysfunctional family system can zap you right back to your childhood in less than a second. So you can feel helpless and angry and afraid. There are some specialized things like being around generations of extended family with children when you are a childless couple who cannot conceive. If it's the first holiday season without a loved one, the holiday traditions can feel very empty and you can feel disconnected. And for the last two and a half years, we have the pandemic worry of can we gather safely? So fill in the one that feels the hardest for you. Maybe one I haven't mentioned. So how do we know if we're suffering or someone around us is suffering? Because remember, we have all this pressure from society about just push through, just be happy, just be grateful. It's the holidays. But here are things you should be maybe checking in with about yourself or about someone who's close to you. I'm noticing we have nursing students here this morning. They're like, yeah, we're learning all that. We've already learned this last year. (laughs) But feeling tired, having a lack of energy, no longer enjoying activities that you used to enjoy, feelings of guilt, worthlessness, hopelessness, a change in personal relationships, maybe you're not reaching out to people as much as you used to, change in sleep, sleeping too much or not enough, increasing or decreasing food take, intake, trouble concentrating, trouble making decisions, which of course, if you're still working at a paid job or a volunteer job, then you're having difficulty working. It sometimes comes out as just irritability because you're less resilient. And so when someone says something or asks you for something, you feel irritable because you don't have that reserve you normally do. Some people think about self-harm during this time of year. I will admit that when I started on this sermon, I normally write my sermons far in advance, or at least I try to get a really good start on them. But I had three pages of notes, and I just couldn't finish. I kept taking out the notes. I kept looking at them. I kept putting them to the side. And I thought, this sermon is such a downer. I don't want to preach it. (laughs) And then I realized the underlying problem was not that the sermon was realistic, but hard, it was that I couldn't fix it for you. I didn't want to preach it because there's no easy fix. And there's no easy fix for any of you who are watching this in your loved ones. But I thought I need to have some sort of positive advice, something you for you can leave with here today and practice or do. So one of the sites I went to, thehealth.com, do not go there. (laughs) the lead line was here are some expert tips to manage holiday depression that will have you singing jingle bells in no time and I thought well that just added on a whole nother layer of guilt because it means you're not doing it well enough if you're not singing jingle bells in no time I thought this was despicable advice we don't need reasons to double down and feel bad about ourselves. 
but I think there are a few things to keep in mind. Don't personalize it. It's not a defect in you. Millions of people are being impacted right now. And would you tell one of your friends or your beloved family members, hey, there's something wrong with you. So show yourself as much compassion as you would show to someone else. We're not good at that. Make sure your expectations for yourself are realistic. You can't do it all, and you can't have a perfect event. Try not to expect too much in others, because they're human too. Practice saying no, because you need to pace yourself. Make a list and prioritize. You can reprioritize that list every day if you want to, depending on your mood and your energy. Limit those societal messages. Every time I see a perfect holiday gathering that looks like it belongs in Southern Living, man, I just hit that mute right then. Don't slack on self-care. I know people get busier, but this is a time more than ever you need to be meditating or going to yoga or exercising or calling a friend. So taking a walk. Limit alcohol and drugs. Right, during the holiday season when they're serving Irish coffee and champagne everywhere. But I think that means be mindful. And if you're lonely, be in community. Volunteer for something or go to an event. I'm saying this somewhat in humor, but I have two things going on right now that you could join in. You can help clean up after the treasure sale. <laughs> I'm just saying, you'll be in community and you'll be laughing at some of the goodies. And also, we have to deliver soup and cookies to a lot of people who aren't able to be here on Sunday mornings or have something difficult in their lives. We're delivering soup, we're delivering cookies, so you could be a driver. Or two of you could be drivers together. Also know my minister door is open to you. I work Sunday through Thursday. I'm almost always in the building Tuesday through Thursday. You can come in and talk. You can just come in and have tea. I am trying to put together a gathering for December 12th that will be about grief and loss and just I feel crummy and I want to just be able to come and sit in a group of people where it's okay to say that. So if you want to be on the list, because I'm going to send out a doodle poll, you have to let me know that you want to be on that list. And just a maybe is okay. It doesn't have to be a for sure. And I'll close with, if it's a family member or a friend who you think is suffering, ask them how they are really doing. Say, I really want to know, and if you want to share, I'm here to listen. I may, not, I, I may have no advice for you whatsoever, but I'm here to listen. Because as our responsive reading tells us, we find comfort in naming feelings, and we find some peace in being together. Amen. <laughs>